All right, so chapter nine will show us, a, now we're gonna take what we learned in the last chapter, chapter um, eight on the parts of the body and look at them more detailed on their function and recognizing when there's an alteration in their function. When their function is altered, excuse me, when a patient is having a medical problem, we will recognize and determine where their issue comes from or what the underlying issue is by understanding the normal function of a cell of the organ or the organ system and to be able to trace down what's gone wrong in this situation. So that's what we do a lot with when we're treating patients for shock, when we're treating respiratory issues, when we're treating cardiac issues and things like that is find all the pieces and parts that point to what is the underlying cause of our problem here. And that concept is called pathophysiology. Between A and P and pathophysiology, I, I believe these are the most important concepts for us to understand in uh, paramedicine because with that foundation is where we um, build our assessments off of. It's great that we can do an assessment, that we can figure out what a patient needs or doesn't need, but um, or what's figure out what is or isn't wrong with the patient but if we don't have a good understanding about how the organs work when we identify a abnormal finding we're not going to recognize what it the it, it's going to be harder for us to recognize the actual treatment or potential outcome for that patient will be so while well, this was one of those questions that we uh determined was um on the it was from chapter nine atrophy hypertrophy hyperplasia dysplasia these are terminologies that we want to um remember because they're what you'll see uh this type of stuff come up a lot in various um uh, when we get to the medical chapter when we get cardiology where they're describing the or naming specifically naming the um the disease for example cardiomyopathy would be a form of weakness caused by an enlarged heart muscle, the apathy there. Uh, all right, so metaplasia, that's like cancer. That's when you have the cell replaced by another type of cell, which then replicates and results in a tumor. Uh, so that's why when you, um, you'll hear the term metastasize with cancer a lot. That means that the cancer cells have now relocated to another part of the body and grown. Um, but the meta is that replacement. So dysplasia, you can see those definitions there. Hypertrophy versus hyperplasia. So hyperplasia is when you have more cells. When we uh, do a normal muscle workout, like you lift weights or whatever, generally we're going to increase the size of the muscle, but it's, uh, we're, increasing the actual size of the cells. We're not adding to the number of cells. So we're not getting the hyperplasia, we're getting the hypertrophy. When, um, which is why, um, like for example, if you get hypertrophy in the heart, uh, that will result in a thicker muscle wall and therefore less movement. Because oftentimes like when a muscle is enlarged or um, it is a, larger than it should be it means it has less range of motion because though it may be strong it doesn't get to move as far and so with the uh, you might have noticed that if you've ever gotten into weight lifting or um, paid any attention to uh, bodybuilders or whatever uh, it's pretty nearly impossible for them to scratch their own back um, they walk around like this all the time because their uh, chest and arm muscles are so large that they can't hold a normal posture or bend their arms in to to normal range of motions. They've had that decrease in range of motion. If we were looking at the same type of hypertrophy happening in the heart, when the walls of the heart enlarge, that means the inner space of the heart is reduced. Because if you recall, we talked about the pericardial sac around the heart and how it's that fibrous membrane that doesn't stretch. Well, when the heart muscle is growing, that membrane is holding the heart's external shape but so the only direction for the muscle to grow is towards the inside of the heart, into the chambers. The chambers get smaller as the muscle gets larger.
All right, so we talked about homeostasis. We talked about the diffusion and osmosis and the movement of water and the movement of solutes a lot in the last chapter. So what we're going to look a little bit more into now is um, what happens when those be when there becomes a significant disturbance or a significant alteration in the um, body move in the body water movement. Excuse me, body water composition. So. Um, there's where ways that we take fluid in, take um, and absorb fluid or remove fluid. Sweating gets rid of it. Salt intake will help us retain it. Um, that's why some of the uh, treatments for high blood pressure would be limiting the salt in your diet so that your lower salt content, lower or less water retention. Um, another point that it didn't mention is how much water we actually lose through respiration. We lose. We can lose up to 2,500 milliliters of water a day just from breathing. Um, here in the southeast, that's far less common because the air that we're breathing in is a lot more humid than it would be, say, in a desert environment or an arid environment. So in those conditions, we're going to lose a lot more water through um, respiration because the air is going to be sucking or absorbing the moisture out of our lungs. So. Size and age plays a big role, obviously, in the amount of water that we have in our body is what is going on here. So here's the term for excess water. Anytime you have excess water stored in any part of your body, we call that edema. Various things can cause it. So we talked a minute ago about peripheral edema or pulmonary edema during the quiz. That is where um, the water peripheral building up in the like the extremities or the legs particularly now the reason it builds up in the legs is the legs are is gravity the legs are the lower part of the body for a person who's standing walking sitting things like that now if the patient's bed uh born you know bed confined and they're on their back all the time then the area that we're going to find the edema build up is in the sacral area um behind the buttocks this can be a number of different conditions cause it. The one I mentioned earlier was the heart and how when the heart is not pumping efficiently, there's a backlog of blood. Now, we're not getting into why the heart's not pumping efficiently at this point, but if the right side of the heart doesn't pump efficiently, you get the backlog of blood in the peripheral. If the left side of the heart's not pumping efficiently, it backlogs the blood into the lungs. So think about heart failure as a traffic jam or as shutting down a portion of the roadway when there's a wreck on the interstate or on a major highway or something the traffic all backs up behind that wreck it's not backing up in front of it so if you think okay heart failure right side left side it's like a car wreck if there's a car wreck on the left side everything's backed up behind it what was right before the left side that would be the lungs um, so on and so forth so that cap that backlog or heart failure can cause the increased capillary pressure and that through pure pressure point um, pressure gradients causes the blood or the liquid to squeeze out of the capillaries faster because it needs somewhere to go. They start expanding and stretching and then the fluid plasma squeezes out. Now, Colloidal osmotic pressure. We talked a little about colloid solutions last week. Um, we mentioned we were talking about crystalloid solutions. Then we talked about colloids and we talked about um, plasma and how plasma has the albumin in it. And that's where colloidal or um, that's what makes it that makes a big difference between why um, crystalloids don't serve as blood replacement as, effic as efficiently as plasma does because crystalloids are um, electrolyte based and those electrolytes can be absorbed by the body whereas the colloids or the the albumin the proteins that's in plasma are not going to be absorbed by the body so what uh, when you have that osmotic pressure change so a decrease in osmotic pressure means that the blood is not pulling the water into the bloodstream the blood um, the concentrations in the blood are very high and so it's not pulling the water back out of the cells and that's resulting in the water leaving the bloodstream and just staying in the third space environment now i mentioned this with the lymphatic vessels a couple classes ago we we're talking about the um, lymph system how you can have a an example would be a condition of lymphat lymphedema where the 
lymph vessels or gland lymph nodes become occluded and this causes a backlog of lymph fluid in that extremity. These generally are isolated to an extremity, but it could be bilaterally. So it could be both arms, it could be both legs, it could be all four, it could just be one leg or just one arm. But when the lymph system is shut down effectively or blocked, then all of the plasma that is being delivered to the tissue to deliver electrolytes, oxygen, things like that, it, it leaves the bloodstream, enters the third space, enters the, and starts to deliver its nutrients to all of the cells. But because the lymph system is shut down, it can't follow the lymph um, vessels back to the vena cava and re-enter blood circulation. And so it starts to build up in that area. This results in a decrease in blood volume overall, de uh, causes um, fluid load, uh, causes issues with um, dehydration and such like that. And it is extremely difficult to treat because lymph vessels are so small, it's not like they can go in and just open them back up and stent them like they could a capillary or a vein or something along those lines. So with that type of an issue, patients are going to be on medications that will cause fluid shifts with the intent of drawing that fluid back out of those extremities through the bloodstream basically creating osmotic pressure gradients. So anytime we see a edema, anytime we're suspecting that, uh, lung sounds need to be a big part of what we're looking for. Um, edema in the legs can cause problems and it can be an indication of a much bigger issue. However, they are not as acute or as uh, concerning, imme immediately concerning as fluid in the lungs. So if we suspect edema, we need to evaluate the lungs and um, make certain that the fluid is not also building up in the lungs because our treatment of pulmonary edema is going to be a bit different than our treatment of peripheral edema. So as you can see here, CPAP and nitrates being the, the most likely diuretics become an extreme uh, or a much later uh, tool to use for the treatment of both pulmonary or pedal edema. Uh, does anybody carry uh, Lasix or know that your department stocks Lasix in the drug box? So Con Athens is nodding their head. ATR has got Lasix. Okay, so do you guys, have you guys experienced, uh, used it, seen it used or anything like that? Oh uh, yes, I've used it what, before CPAP became a really big push. We were using it a lot. Yeah, same here. So, um, Early 2000s, um, the Lasix was the treatment for congestive heart failure. Come about 2009 or so, 2008, 2009, um, CPAP started really uh, becoming popular. A lot of departments didn't have it. It still took as late as 2012 for it to become more standard um, recognized but the treatment of congestive heart failure shifted from uh, Lasix, which is the diuretic, to CPAP, which changes the pressures. Now, Lasix is a specific type of diuretic. It is a loop diuretic. It works in the loop of Henle. Now, you might remember from last week, we were discussing the loop of Henle in the kidneys and how you have one side of the loop that absorbs water and the other side of the loop that absorbs the uh, salt and potassium and how the blood flows opposite of the concentrate so that it can cause that fluid shift. Well, Lasix prevents the sodium and potassium from being absorbed by the uh, by that side of the loop of Henle, the ascending loop. <clears throat> and since sodium and potassium can't be absorbed there, then you can't, then, then most of it stays in the urine concentrate or in the, the filtrate is what it's called. So that means the water that's in the filtrate stays in the filtrate because it's not going to leave. Um, there isn't that concentration gradient, so it stays in the filtrate, and the per person or the patient produces a lot more urine, and it can, and it works very rapidly if they have healthy kidneys. The problem, so while this did work effectively for the treatment of a patient, you 
cause them to produce urine, which pulled a lot of fluid out of their blood. And then in their lungs, suddenly the blood has lower fluid concentrations and lower fluid volumes than the uh, lungs did. So it would pull the water out of the lungs back into the bloodstream. This could work and it was great. But um, Lasix works specifically on potassium, not so much on sodium, but the salt potassium. And when it does that, it lowers your blood potassium concentrations. Now, potassium levels are very, very important. Um, potassium plays a major role in the depolarization of cell membranes. When the blood concentration of potassium decreases, it has to be balanced with the intracellular potassium level. And so potassium leaves the cells to enter the bloodstream in order to balance the two out so that they maintain that homeostasis. When this concentration shift happens, you've now dehydrated the patient by pulling fluid out of their lungs or by pulling fluid out of their blood, which resulted in the fluid leaving their lungs. But now you've pulled the potassium out of their um, cells, which pulls the fluid out of their cells with it. So now their cells are starting to crenate. They're starting to shrink. This crenation, which will happen throughout the entire body, especially in the brain cells and muscle cells, um, can happen quite quickly after the event. Well, while it happens quickly to dehydrate them and crenate them that way, the rehydration is really slow. For example, if we were to say, oh, okay, well, we've got their heart failure fixed, their heart's pumping right, but their fluid volumes are low, so let's just give them some fluid and it'll, it'll all fix. If you started pumping them full of fluids really fast, um, you know, like, hey, we're gonna give them a 20 milliliter per kilogram bolus. It's what we would consider an appropriate fluid bolus. Because their cells have been dehydrated and because they've pulled a lot of fluid out of their cells and potassium out of their cells, that fluid that we're adding to their bloodstream is very rapidly going to shift back into their cells. And while a cell can handle shrinking fast, it can't handle swelling fast. Whenever it swells really fast, it starts to burst. And so you cause a massive fluid shift very rapidly. While that can be painful in the extremities, like in the muscle and all that, it's not normally very damaging or at least not permanently so. When that happens in the nerve tissue of the brain, that's a different story because the skull won't stretch and it can only swell so much and those neurons don't have a lot of extra space and stretch in them. So you get a, um, a lot, of, you can have a lot of brain damage from that. Of course, they figured this out a very, very long time ago. And even though we would give Lasix frequently, the patient would end up spending upwards of a week in the ICU while they slowly readministered potassium and fluids to try to rehydrate them and rebalance them. Was that always the case? No. It was more commonly though um, the case, though, in patients where we have he heavy doses of um, Lasix. Now, we were like, okay, but we saved their life. We got rid of their CHF, we, we fixed that. Well, yes, but we fixed it and then put them in the ICU, which meant they were on a ventilator, which meant they were in higher risk of acquiring infections and lowering their chances of coming off that ventilator and it just increasing risk of death all around. So these are some of the things that we've learned over the years about the use of Lasix pre-hospital. A lot of departments still carry it. It has a role as a more or less a last ditch effort if you if nothing else is working to uh, clear these lungs out. We obviously need to get gas exchange in the lungs so it can be very helpful. However, if you are um, have the alternative method like CPAP or uh, nitro, you can be a lot more um, effective. Now, interestingly enough, it hasn't caught on uh, in general, but there's been some in some interesting research done in the use of catapress. Catapress is an alpha um, ad um, stimulator, alpha receptor um, agonist, and it causes um, arterial and vessel vasodilation that way. We know that nitroglycerin causes vasodilation, particularly on the vascular, or excuse me, on the venous side, and so right now we tend to give nitro, dilate the capillaries of the lungs, which would cause a reduce in pressure in them. And then we put the CPAP on their face and f increase the pressure inside their alveoli. So it causes that gradient to move the fluid out of their lungs into their vessels. Well, if catapress uh, has a longer action 
potential, or excuse me, a longer half-life, it stays in the system longer and is more effective, whereas Nitro, though it has a 30-minute half-life, its effectiveness is only about 5 to 10 minutes before it's worn off. And that's why we get redose Nitro every 3 to 5 minutes in order to maintain that therapeutic level. We'll talk a lot more about those kind of terms and such in pharmacology, but it's something I wanted to explain how different diuretics or how um, different treatments of edema work and try to tie into what we were talking about with the kidney last week. So isotonic, what does this mean? Well, if you remember, we talked about isotonic saline and isotonic fluids. Isotonic means the same tonicity or the same concentration as the cells or as the blood. We want to give the fluids to our patient with the same concentration as the blood so that we're not causing a swelling or a shrinking of the cells. We want everything to stay pretty much the same. And isotonic will do isotonic fluids will do that. So an isotonic fluid deficit is when you've lost fluid, but you've also lost the concentrate. So you're losing both the salt, potassium, and the water in equal con um, quantities. This would be like sweating. When we sweat, we lose salt, potassium, sodium, right? And water. Um, if you're not... But if you are vomiting a lot of water or you're having diarrhea, you may not be losing the salt. You're just losing the water. Or um, if you're not drinking uh, water or you're, let's say you're just drinking water, but you're not drink replacing the electrolytes, that's causing another type of fluid de deficit. So, so again, if it says isotonic, that's when you have proportionate quantities of salt or um, you have salts and water. Uh, being lost or gained. You can have a hypotonic or a hypertonic fluid deficit if, for example, hypotonic would be you're losing the electrolytes, but you've got a lot of water, or you could have the hypertonic where you're losing the water, but you have lots of electrolytes. So, while I don't want you to have to memorize the numbers on these, they, they would play a huge role when you get into, if you get into critical care medicine, because we evaluate labs and work on that kind of stuff a bit more in critical care. Don't do it very much. We don't do it in pre-hospital. We can't measure a person's sodium or potassium levels. We'll see, we'll get called to nursing homes for things like, oh yeah, we, um, their, their labs came back last week and they're abnormal. So we need to send them to the hospital and it's like, oh yeah, whatever. But we can't really do anything with that. We can't reevaluate that in the field. So don't worry so much about what the numbers are. Worry about what their what the um, results of abnormalities or the results of a change are. Is somebody trying to ask a question? Okay. So hypertonic, um, uh, high concentration hypo kind of already put pointed out what those are. Um, so as you can see, a hypertonic fluid deficit, which I mentioned before, you're losing fluid, but not salt. You're going to have hypernatremia, high salt levels, high sodium content. Hypotonic, you're going to have low sodium content. So hypertonic, hypotonic is going to be um, more often caused where the patient is absorbing um, too much water and not enough electrolytes. So kind of like the water toxicity patients I talked about. Another example of a hypertonic um, fluid deficit or hypotonic fluid deficit is a patient who is using diuretics like Lasix, but is not using uh, or supplementing their electrolytes. Any patient who's chronically on Lasix should be prescribed potassium to go along with it because that potassium is gonna replace the potassium they're losing in their system um, through the uh, removal of water. So the hypotonic deficits are gonna come when they're losing water, excuse me, when they're losing their salts but not losing as much water. And so you would get that, like the patient's urinating, they're losing water, and they're just drinking new water, more water, but not replacing the electrolytes. This is why sports drinks, um, electrolyte uh, drinks, Pedialyte, Gatorade, stuff like that can be really helpful when you're working out because, or when you're um, sweating a lot, because you're losing those electrolytes, you need to replace the electrolytes with water. But you should be balancing that you know, for every quart of electrolyte 
uh, solution you're drinking, you should be drinking a quart of water so that you get that um, balance between water and electrolytes. All right, so take a notice of this though, though I don't want you to memorize these numbers, I want you to take notice of it. Our sodium levels are 136 to 144 milliequivalents per liter. So, all right, well, that doesn't mean much yet, but look at this, potassium, 3.5 to 5 milliequivalents per liter. Our blood potassium levels are very low compared to our sodium, or excuse me, our blood sodium levels. Inside the cell, it's incidentally the exact opposite. The, high, the cells have a high level of potassium with a low level of sodium proportionately during their resting phase, the non-depolarized phase. So um, when the cell um, depolarizes, so like with the cardiac cell or a muscle cell firing or a nerve cell, the sodium and potassium actually trade places. Now, sodium wants to enter the cell all the time. Potassium wants to leave the cell all the time. But ATP run pumps, energy powered pumps, are what pump it back out against that gradient. And that's why we need that constant supply of ATP. If the patient stops producing ATP through like anaerobic metabolism due to a lack of blood flow or lack of oxygen or something like that, then they run out of AP. ATP, the ATP pumps are um, shut down and the sodium just starts entering the cell and doesn't get pumped back out. The potassium starts leaving the cell but doesn't get pumped back in and that causes fluids to shift into the cell because there's so much salt moving, so much sodium moving in, the cell will eventually swell and burst. And that's where we get rhabdomyolysis, that's where we get um, irreversible shock and such like that. No, the byproducts of cell destruction of that lysis is what's going to result in organ failure like kidney shutdown or liver shutdown or something like that at a later date. So uh, potassium levels, there's your hypo and hyperkalemia. Calcium, again, fairly low um, in the blood, but actually relatively high in the cell because a lot of the calcium is stored in the sarcoplasmic reticulum for the muscles or the, you know, wherever it happens to be. Or whichever type cell it is. Um, also, we know that calcium is in, instrumental in the formation of bones, but when our calcium levels are too low, our um, parathyroid gland secretes hormones that break down the bones and release the calcium into the blood, and that's the parathyroid hormone. All right, so phosphates, again, another one that's really low. We don't actually talk a whole lot about, well, we, we talk a whole lot about it because it's the part of ATP. We talked about ADP in the video. The other day we were talking about glycolysis and how we take ADP, bind it with inorganic phosphate, and then boom, we have ATP. And then ATP is that energy source. So ATP plays a big, or excuse me, phosphate plays a big role in that, but otherwise we don't really look at phosphate as far as like fluid shifts and things and cell depolarization. Phosphate is there to make ATP. Magnesium, uh, well, so like a minute ago I was describing salt, how salt is high outside the cell and potassium is high inside the cell and they work opposite of each other. Calcium and magnesium have a similar function. It's not as cut and dry as that, calcium plays, as we remember the other day in the video about um, muscle contraction, calcium binds to the troponin, displacing the tropomyosin, and you get muscle contraction. Magnesium, on the other hand, if it was in, present in higher levels, will prevent that muscle contraction from happening and actually causes muscle relaxation. Magnesium can be a muscle relaxer. That's why magnesium is the primary ingredient that you're going to find in laxatives. Milk of magnesia, mag citrate, this is all magnesium-based laxatives the, where high concentrations of magnesium will... Um, relax the contraction of the smooth muscles of the GI tract, making it easier for blockages to be moved and for the bowel movement to happen. While it works on lower doses in the um, GI tract, if it gets to be toxic levels or higher levels, it will start working on skeletal muscle. 
Um, magnesium, you may have heard of it being used to treat preeclamptic seizures, or excuse me, eclamptic seizures in pregnant women, but it can also be used in the hospital to treat as a, as a tocolytic, um, to stop labor. It's used to treat preterm labor. So when a woman's going into labor before it's time for the baby to be born and they're wanting to let the baby incubate a little bit longer and, you know, develop some more, they'll give her a mag drip in order to stop the contractions and the magnesium weakens the contraction of the uterus so it just can't contract and um but it will also weaken the um, function of all of the other skeletal muscles a side effect of this is a reduction in co coordination and strength so patients who are on a mag drip to keep them from going into labor or to stop their labor can't get up and walk around because their legs would go to jelly and they would fall. So they have to be assisted. Um, they actually, a lot of times, will gauge the dose of magnesium on does the patient still have a deep tendon reflex. They'll do the whole hammer on the knee um, thing to see if they kick their leg. And once they lose that reflex, they know that their muscles are, their mag levels are as high as they can be because that reflex disappears before the um, diaphragm will stop functioning, which is the ultimate overdose concern with magnesium. So if your mag, your, um, mag levels are too high, your diaphragm will get so weak that you stop breathing effectively. Um, it's not that you're not getting the drive to breathe, it's that the diaphragm itself just can't contract anymore. So that is a concern with magnesium. Do we have any questions on that? We good moving on so far? We uh, we just hit a lot of those different um, electrolytes. Um, please know the names of the high and the low. Please, uh, you know, what do we call those conditions? Please know where the um, electrolyte is found and please know what its basic function in the body is. All right, so we again, we're going to talk more about uh, the pH balance. We discussed that last week, um, or not, was it last week or was it the week before? I can't remember which week we discussed pH, but I know we were talking about how stomach acids, pH 7, are we want to, our body to pH to be 7.35 to 7.45. Um, concentration of hydrogen ions, I, and I mentioned that earlier this morning. Oops, uh, going too fast. All right, so all right, so we have okay. I don't. I know I didn't get heavily into what causes or what buffers and balances our pH. I just talked about that it exists and how we can become acidotic or alkalotic. But we didn't get into what causes that, what maintains that, and um, the side effects of it. But acid base is going to be a, month, a lot more here to discuss. So I know you guys have probably been sitting a while. Um, we've been here an hour since we started reviewing the quiz. So we'll go ahead and take a break, and then we'll get into acid base when you guys uh, come back.